like townhouse you walk in and it's got stairs that go up but they sort of go back deep not terribly wide but a little bit and there's always a half bath right when you walk in the front door right there on your right just a toilet and a sink okay He's got these shit problems. He's going upstairs to the main bathroom. He's going to the second one. They're all being used. It's a, you know, a small townhouse with like a hundred people in it. And he's telling his wife, he's like, I'm having to shit in that that half bath. And the living room is packed full of people eating and everything. She's like, Don't do it. He's like, I'm gonna have to shit. I'm gonna have to go in there and do it. And he just says, Sorry. <laughs> and he went and did it. And I mean, he said he was in there for 25 minutes and came out. He the hope he said the food, everything. He ruined everything. The party fucking. They all left. They all fucking left. And she had to go back and work with him. He didn't have to see him. She had to see him. They were like, man, your husband shit this Fuck house up and ruined the fucking... That's a horrible, horrible situation. That's horrible. You go to well, some you need the... that half bath, though. Listen, man, I used to do a lot of coke. So I go to people's houses. I do two bumps of coke. And the first thing you got to do is take a shit. And I tell them, you got another bathroom? They go, no, use that one. I go, oh, Jesus. And listen, the worst shit you'll take are the ones in some of these houses, the sticky ones. You yeah. get two rolls of toilet paper. They don't have no more rolling paper. You got to fucking yell out for them for fucking toilet paper. Mm-hmm. The worst shits I have to take are when I'm out. You know, at that coffee shop we go to, Marie E.T. Oh, really? And you got to run to the bathroom, and then there's somebody in there shitting oh, already. Man. I get furious. Yeah. Well, sometimes I just drink coffee and got to pee, and I run to the bathroom, and somebody took a shit in that bathroom. My blood pressure goes 200 over. <laughs> I get furious, people who shit on the outside, because I try my hardest not to shit in the street. Oh, yeah. I really do. I really fucking do. I hate, and I always have to shit when I'm leaving the house, it seems like. When I'm just about to leave the house, more. that's why I'm calm. I get up at 6. I give myself a few hours. Fake it out a little no, bit. No, there's people who leave the house and expect to go to somebody else's place of residence or business and fuck up their bathroom. Because your friend, I understand, he was very sick. I don't want people coming over to my house and taking this shit. No, hell no. Oh, not and, like that. And you especially. know when people come over and they look like Ari will come to your house and go, can I use your bathroom? That means <laughs> fucking you're done. You're done. You're done. I haven't had a house with a guy for a while. My dad was just here for a weekend. It was... This is a family story that he went. We went to hit my aunt's house, his sister's, and he pooped. And then my my cousin went in and puked. <laughs> and she was like ten. And From she the came smell, in, she just came vomited. In, she came in crying. Uncle <laughs> Dicky, you made my you made my you made me puke from your poop. How many how many fucking places did I go to when I was doing blow and I destroyed the bathroom to the point where the toilet got stuck? Because when you do cocaine. It loosens everything up. You start dropping everything. Everything. Pa, pa, pa. Legs, chicken <laughs> wings, bones. <laughs> oh my God. It's fucking horrible. I miss cocaine. There's a matchbox. That's star the one here. thing about cocaine. You do it and it cleans you out, and then you're running on an empty stomach the rest of the night. Your stomach is growling, but you don't want to eat because you're fucking doing bad. It's tremendous. Um, crazy. I'll never forget. My grandmother used to tell me this story all the time. My grandmother was hip, and uh, she and, and one of our cousins, he was older, but they shared a birthday, December 8th, I believe. And uh, they would always get together for coffee and hang out on their birthday. And they went to this place that was called White Coffee Pot Junior back in Baltimore, and they were sitting down having coffee. And my grandma said, oh, my God, I need to use the bathroom. So she goes into the ladies' room. She's telling us this. And she sits, she squats over the toilet, and she's got terrible diarrhea. And she said, I cleaned myself, and when I was done, I turned around to put the toilet paper in, and nothing was in the toilet. And she said, I looked up on the wall, and it was everywhere. It sprayed all up on the wall, and she's like, oh, my God. So she runs out and washes her hands, and as she's getting ready to come out, here comes a female attendant to clean it. My grandmother just looked at her and goes, I don't look what some sick son of a bitch in there did. That's disgusting. Hold ass out of there. Grab my cousin and said, we're getting the it fuck out of here. It was perfect. Yeah, it was the timing of death. <laughs> she just thought quick, like, uh, that's fucking disgusting. I can't even be in here. Boom, I almost shit myself the other day. I was at the urinal. When my mom, when my mom, my, my dad and Paula met, and I was taking a piss, and I thought I had to fart, and I, it, it like, almost came out. I, like, I was able to stop it at the last minute. but It's a horrible yeah. situation when you shit yourself. <laughs> I do it once a year. Just do it. You don't know. Only once a year? But yeah, you eat like I bad food. You don't know. You go there for the first time, and people in L.A., oh, it's great food. And you go in there, and they give you that <laughs> fucking canned shrimp. That canned shrimp goes through me. I don't fuck <laughs> like with water, it. yeah. Last week, a bunch of my friends said that the golden <laughs> chopsticks is good on, on Laurel Canyon. 
I've always driven by it. Is it so good? the other night, I go, you know what, honey? You want Chinese? I want Chinese. Let's go to the Golden Chopsticks. Mercy didn't want to go nowhere, so I go, I'll go get it. We ordered it on the phone. The shrimp was horrible. The wings were delicious until you bit into them, and then you could see they were glued together. <laughs> like the 7-Eleven wings, they're purple. They got like the low grade of yeah, wings. Yeah. Like the chickens got cancer or something. They got weak <laughs> wings. Their wings break. The wings with the, listen, the best wings in L.A., 10, 15, my wife was saying, best wings you could ever have in L.A. One, are at Rice on La Cienega next to Vito's Pizza down there. Oh, I know where Vito's is. There used to be a is. place named Rice next door. Now it's something else. They serve sushi. But 15 years ago, when I was 418, how do you think I got to be 418? I would go to Rice and get three order of wings. Six to an order, garlic wings. Oh, just no that. sauce, no blue cheese, no celery, just fucking wing meat with garlic juice on it. Chinese stuff, fresh, delicious. Six ninety five a piece. Really? Eight ninety five. I didn't give a fuck. Me and my wife were going to get the lunch special and three order of fucking wings. The tables, and my wife said to me, she goes, we never had those wings again. Just delicious. And this place, the wings were, like I said, they were, I didn't get sick the next day. I'm not going to lie to you. The pork fried rice was, I didn't eat a lot of it. The shrimp and garlic sauce was just horrific. And it was the shrimp. If they would have used the size big, it would have been. Yeah. Once you give me those little shrimp, you're insulting me. Yeah, yeah thank you. You want to use those for shrimp fried rice, I'm not mad at you. But for shrimp and garlic sauce, you got to go a little bigger. And we got something else. I ate some white rice, and that was it. I love shrimp, but I don't get it very many places. Like, it's... If I don't, I'll have to go to like a Thai place for a while before I try like their shrimp pad Thai. I'm a seafood mm. snob, man. People, shrimp cook in like two minutes. People overcook them. They're always rubbery and shit. And then you start freezing them. They don't know how to freeze them. They have fuck all that shit up. I told my wife to stop buying the shrimp from Costco. Yeah. The same thing. The big bag we went. And then you would go out and eat shrimp. And you're like, Jesus, that tastes like real fucking shrimp. They give me that old, and I told you, that's that old fucking, some Jew. Listen. When they dropped that Exxon oil, <laughs> some, fuck, <laughs> some fucking Jew was like, go down there and buy everything up. Sharks, everything that's floating with oil. <laughs> we'll wash this shit off and we'll freeze it. Stop we'll freeze Costco. this shit. <laughs> and that's what they did. Some fucking sick fucking <laughs> white dude went down there with right, a net. Though, think I'm kidding you. With a net. They don't show you that shit. They got to save them fish. <laughs> if they weren't sold here, they were sold somewhere else. They were sold somewhere else. <laughs> They oh, scoop man. those little Exxon oil fish before the oil goes into the, the BP skin. BP one, I think you're saying. You will BP Exxon. They all. They all. Yeah. They all. You all wash done those them. motherfuckers off and you freeze them. You put some salt and pepper on them to, <laughs> to freeze them like that, and you sell them to fucking whoever. They don't know what the fuck you. And that's why I think that Costco shrimp is. It's definitely like related to that shrimp, like they're second cousins to that oil fucking <laughs> shrimp. <laughs> all right. To that situation, you know, what I mean, much like what he's saying with you, like. You want to hear what you're going to say next. People really enjoy, uh, you know, the whatever it is behind it, uh, the the sarcasm, the smart assness, the 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 funny, uh, the clever. You know, because the other thing too is, as comedians, we say what people are thinking, but we, it, I think it's our job to say that same thing in a way they've never thought of saying that. Does that make sense? Yes. No, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it's 100 percent relatable. But maybe you picked the right word here or, you know, chose it to say it this way instead. Uh, and so it still hits home. But it's like, wow, because, I, I, you know, I think it's our job to to write beyond that. I think if someone pays you to see that, if I'm going to relate to you, I should be able to say it to you in a way. Maybe you hadn't thought about saying it, but you get my point exactly. That makes sense. <laughs> Absolutely, you're freaking me out of here. <laughs> you look good too, Joey Diaz. So do you. Everybody's you looking do. good. Lisa, I got some sun to him and shit. This weekend up there in the Southern Resort, whatever the fuck you were. I had a good time in Minneapolis. That's a great little fucking room, man. I, people, I hear it, yeah. The super nice people. I get, some, some guy gave me maple syrup and rice. <laughs> And then he wrote me a note, but he didn't write me his fucking name. I can't even give him a fucking shout out. He gave uh, you syrup and rice? Oh was, it, was it cooked rice or was it just yeah, a bag of Like each? in a bag to cook it. Then some other guy gave me two hits of acid. <laughs> People asked me if I want to do meth. That's a crazy fucking thing. You guys are going to send me to the re- to I lost the acid. I can't the crazy find house. it. It was in my wallet somewhere. I don't know what I did with it. Oh, my God. I'll bump into that someday when you're in an airport yeah. stuck. 
you stick your head in one of your compartments and there it is, a hit of acid and you got a nine hour stop and you got some e-cigs, you got a vapor pen, fuck it, you go for broke, Jack. I told you, I look, here it is. I, I smoke weed, obviously, but drugs have always, they've always scared me for me. But in the right situation. What's the worst drug you've ever done? Uh, I mean, outside of weed, the only two drugs I've ever done are shrooms one time, and I did uh, ecstasy like twice. What did you think of and the ecstasy? first time it didn't work. The second time, a, a girlfriend I was dating from Argentina gave me that. We shit. We went and rented a cabin up in Big Bear. That was the gr- one of the greatest nights of my life. I mean, it was. I, uh, I, how long were you the, high with, for? Oh, hours. Six, five hours maybe. And I mean. I understood finally because everyone kept describing to me what it did and how it felt. And finally, when I felt that permanent smile get plastered on my face, I was like, oh, this is what it is. And it was just that was a lot of fun. But shrooms to me, I enjoyed that shit for like 45 minutes. And then I was just like, all right, I want this enough. Get it out of me. Get it out of me. You know, I always if I ever I don't know, most of the time I don't get high. I just, you know, smoke. And I relax. And then you just dissipate and float out of it. But with shrooms, that shit just hung around. And I wanted it to be over. I was like, enough of this. Last Sunday, we did a head of acid on the show. And it was uh, pretty intense. It got pretty intense at moments. It was. And it was fun. And I had to leave. Because if not, we would have stayed here till 6 in the morning. Like That's how you feed an acid trip. Is with people talking and conversation and smoking weed and... I don't know if I could have gone out publicly like I used to. You could go out publicly on acid? When I was 16. Where really? would you go? I didn't have a house. I didn't. Yeah. I, I lived with some people, but I couldn't stay in and watch TV with them and do a hit of acid. So you met four of your friends, and you took a hit of acid at 730. <laughs> That met by 11. You're burning. Yeah, you yeah. are burning. And How old are you? 16, 17. And you're behind the high school looking See, I would have come with you, but I would have yes, been scared to death to do the acid. Looking at the clouds. We'd get, in those days, you bought $25, got you like 30 joints. So you rolled them up. You rolled up 30 joints before you went out. So everybody knew where they stood. Like, we're not going home till we smoke 30 fucking joints. Like, that's crazy. And sometimes we'd smoke 25 and we'd each take a joint home for the morning, you know, like that. We were tight, but that was it. But we went out till 4 or 5 in the morning when you tripped your fucking balls. I don't think I'd like that. Walking around. Or we'd do what we did the other night and go to the midnight movie. That's a blast. It's not. A, it, you don't freak out sitting in a movie theater. No, in fact, you can you even concentrate on the movie. Yes, oh, the yeah. movie sucks you in. Okay, the colors are brighter. At least that's. What <clears throat> yeah, the, at one point the movie will just suck you, in. at first you'll be like, I wouldn't take Lee to see like the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Oh, that was terrible. Because I'd kick him. I couldn't. I'd stab him while we were sitting there and go crazy. Get I me the like, fuck out of here. I feel like you'd kill people at the Rocky Horror. Picture yeah, show. No, no, no. Like I, I went once and they got so excited, they were like jumping up in their seats. A girl broke up with me over not going to the Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> I, you got a we personal were, vendetta for that. We <laughs> weren't even boyfriend girlfriend. Well, were you? She, I was nineteen. She was twenty-seven. <laughs> she, was, <clears throat> she was my neighbor. She was an Italian girl from Milwaukee, and she had a sister, Tia, Mia, something, and she used to cut my hair. Man, I was a nineteen-year-old kid. I, I just moved from Jersey to Basalt, Colorado, Holland Hills. I'm living in Holland Hills in a house with four fucking bedrooms and three guys that are fucking each bench pressing 480, you know. One of them went back to live. Uh, His mom had a heart attack, so he left. And the one guy that was a garbage man, he was a garbage man in Aspen, and he'd come home every night with skis and shit like that. It was a pretty bizarre time. I was a young kid. I was fresh out of New York. Everything I looked at had a price tag. You know, I was a shark, man. I was a fucking shark. But these girls lived next door to me. And they were very nice. They'd come over and they'd make dip. And and they were like Green Bay Packer fans. And we'd watch football and blah, blah, blah. And the girl said, you know, I cut hair. The older one is like, I cut hair. So I went over there one day and she's cutting my hair, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then, you know, it just went, we were just friends. And, and then sometimes I would go to her where... 
she worked at a wine shop called the Grog Shop. I still remember. And I would meet her, and she would give me a ride in what's called Down Valley. Like, if you work in Aspen, you have to go Down Valley. You have to go past Snowmass, past Old Snowmass, into Basalt and Woody Creek and all that shit. So, I, you know, we would just flirt. We would just flirt. And one night I asked her black, blatantly, Lee, blatantly, I said, she goes, what's your, I said, oh, she was cutting my hair and I put my hand under her skirt. And she goes, what's your problem? And I go, I like you, I got a crush on you. And she goes, just say so. Just don't put your hand under my skirt. That's not gentlemanly. Like, she goes, what do you want to do? You want to take me on a date? You just want to fuck. Just tell me your intentions. It was that blatant. Like, it was that blatant. And I go, I really don't know. I just... I don't know. I, th I thought I'd take it to a movie or something. And she goes, I'll date you, but you got to move out of next door. She goes, I can't date a neighbor. It'll never happen. And I was moving anyway. We were moving at the end of the month. So I waited till July 1st. <laughs> and I hitchhiked down there. This is the savage I am. Yep. I fucking hitchhiked down there at 10 o'clock <laughs> at night. And I just knocked on her screen door. And she's like, what are you doing here? I go, I moved out. I'm ready for our date. What do you want to do? And she goes, come on in. And I think we did a little blow. Her sister was there. The sister was really nice. We talked for a little while. And then she took me upstairs. And I think we stayed up all night and did dirty stuff. And <laughs> and uh, she drove me home the next day. And it was like she was old, you know, she was older. But I remember the first time my roommate in snow mask caught me with it. Because she would go to work 5 to 12 or 5 to 10. So she would come up in the afternoons, and my buddy would be, you know, working. But he knew her from the building. We all lived together next to her. I, I just never told him that I was with her. It's nobody's business. <clears throat> she came up one afternoon with brie cheese. That's the first time I ever <laughs> ate brie cheese and an apple, dog. I'm an American cheese type of guy. At that time, I'd only tasted American and Swiss cheese, and that was all. How did you know that? And she you showed had up. You well, she showed up with brie fucking cheese and an apple, and she smeared it on the apple, and I'm like, are you fucking crazy? I'm from Jersey. Right. That, yeah, right. At that time, I was hustling Columbia House. Yeah, I remember. It was a record company named Columbia House. Yeah. So I was hustling them. So it was I was like uh, 20 cassettes for a penny or some shit like that. Eight cassettes for At least they had that row CDs when I was going And to then play. the next three were That's at right. $21.99, right. and you had to buy four albums in a year to cancel your subscription. Fuck you. I would put that penny on a postcard because remember you had to put a penny. Yep. You had a fucking Scotch tape a penny on a postcard. And your little stamps for the albums and you wanted. And your little stamp for the albums and send it. So I would keep sending it to the same address, only under different names. <laughs> so my godmother wouldn't know what the fuck was going on. Every time I go to my godmother, she kept, you keep getting these bills up here. Who's Carlos Torres? Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> and then I started doing it all. I started doing it. Anybody's house I went to, I would take their address down. And I would talk to my mother. My mother would go, you got a box over at Guillermo's house. And I'd go, really? That's it. And I'd go over to Guillermo's house, and for a year, he got bills from me. And he would come to the bar. Why am I getting bills at my house from Columbia House? I scanned for Columbia House for, like, every album. They had Christmas albums, Hell yeah. black albums, Spanish albums. We had a teacher that told us, if you're, he told us in high school, and we were, we were sophomores, he gamed it straight up. He's like, I'll be honest with you. If you're under 18, you don't have to pay for shit. And he told all of us, he encouraged us, go get all those CDs you want. And then when they send you a bill, he said, take out a crayon and write, I'm 16 and send that shit back. You'll never hear from him ever again. So we would do the same thing, but we wouldn't do it that much. We would send it to the, a, a buddy over here or down the street. Oh, I ordered yeah. everything on, on, yeah, on everything. magazines. I ordered the thing. I wanted a little trophy. When I first came from Cuba, what? I couldn't wait to get a trophy. <laughs> you just, a, so, just a trophy? I just wanted a trophy. <laughs> Sometimes you just want a trophy. <laughs> Sometimes you want a Kit Kat. I just wanted a trophy. trophy. What kind of trophy do you want? So I just wanted a trophy. <laughs> Anything. So Joe Weeder had this thing. The muscle I remember guy, Joe Weeder, yeah. There was yeah. a guy at the beach, a chick with a skinny guy at the beach, and the muscle guy comes over and kicks sand in his face. It was like a cartoon. And then you <laughs> sent a dollar ninety nine to Joe Weeder, and he sent you back training tips and a trophy that you were a weightlifter. And you would have to do the push-ups. And then you came back a week later and beat the guy up to taking your chick when you had muscles. <laughs> what a marketing scam. Oh, I see. All and right. I'm yeah. going, Jesus Christ, this is hilarious. Like, I had little trophies from Joe Weeder. 
I ordered, that's when you had to order whoopee cushions, right? X ray glasses. <laughs> so they'd show you X ray glasses. There'd be a girl in a bikini, and you with X ray glasses on like this. With your mouth open, those X-ray glasses didn't fucking no. work. You got beat, Jack. Right, you did. You'd be like, and then they had Spanish Fly. And I remember that the first time me and my buddies bought fat Spanish Fly, we're like, <laughs> who were we going to give it to? And we gave it to one of my friend's grandmother. We all went over there and watched fucking Donnie and Marie. And we just stared at the grandmother for like two hours to see if she would scratch her pussy. Anything. Give us a sign that you're only grandma. Grandma didn't do shit, so we never Because if this. she was, you we, were, eyes were ready. Oh, yeah, we were like in the eighth grade. <laughs> I'll never forget the kid giving up his mother. He's like, fuck it, let's use it on my mother. <laughs> I don't want to say his name because people hate him. But I still remember going to his house, watching the Donnie and Marie for family Gave hour. His grandma, Like man. four of us just sitting there going, is she scratching the pussy yet? Like... Is she fingering herself? Like, we're all waiting for Like, she's f- just going to do that in yeah. the living room. <laughs> like, you're such a fucking idiot when you're a kid. Yeah, you are. Right. Spanish you flies and make a woman go crazy. Oh, and that was the yeah. ad. Like, the ad was a girl in a bar, and then a girl passed out like Cosby's, and you're fucking her. That was the lead. That was the ad in the late 60s, 70s. You meeting a girl at a bar, like, with a martini glass, and the next minute you're both in bed, like, giggling, like, making love. That was the ad for Spanish fly. So it guaranteed women would get loose. Yeah, but then you're not supposed to give it to the grandma. But that was our... We you're wanted a to, kid. They before didn't we know. Gave, before we gave it to girls in the seventh grade. She was grade, a tester. <laughs> before we gave it to girls in the seventh grade. Seventh grade. Like eighth grade, yeah. we wanted to test it. Like we got in the mail on a Friday and we couldn't wait. We couldn't fucking wait to test on somebody. <laughs> so this kid volunteered his grandma. Give it to grandma. <laughs> grandma. She's going to be over there. My mom's going to be out playing cards. If she dies, who gives a fuck? And we gave, <laughs> like, we, we, I never forget, he gave grandma like two capsules. And we put them in like what, her tea like or milk something? Or something. Yeah. <laughs> grandma, you want some warm milk? Bless your heart. We're sitting there all night fucking howling, waiting for grandma to start finger banging herself. That oh night, the, we left there depressed as fuck. Was grandpa still alive? We lost our investment. <laughs> we were a bunch of perverted oh, kids. Then there was a time shit. you could order pornos. You could order pornos, and it came with a fucking projector. It came with equipment. Super eight projector. So it was a super eight projector, and a and a point and two homemade pornos, and you had to send the money order. So you had to walk up to the fucking Chinese store or the post office, get a money order. You couldn't go to your mother and get a check. In those days, it wasn't like now that they could deposit a check. You had to wait twenty two days for a check to clear in the fucking sixties and seventies. It was a nightmare. So we had to get a money order. And I still remember waiting six weeks for the fucking camera to come. And it came in a box and you plugged it in. And it was very frail. And it just had two things. And it was Super 8. So it had two reels. And you connected this one to this one. You pressed play. And wound to the other. And it would just go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And it worked? Yeah. And it would go down to like, and all of a sudden, like a fucking chick that was beat up would come up. And she would start (laughs) sucking some guy's dick that was huge. And. They were disgusting pornography. It wasn't nothing like what you see today. The chick didn't know she was being taped. You know, most of the times there were rapes that were being filmed. And these are being mailed to people? <clears throat> there, there was no legislation. Right, yeah. Nobody, nobody, nobody gave <laughs> yeah. a fuck. Was this like a porn magazine? Like they would have this, these like, ads? It would be like a cheap porn magazine. There was a Puerto Rican porn magazine called Pica Pica. And it was, just, <laughs> it was w- naked women with their faces covered. Why do I want to see that? Right. Like, this guy was tricking chicks. Like, he would take right. them home and take their pictures and, and put, like, black over their eyes. And, sh- and they would show you their pussy. Like, they had that magazine. I forgot what magazine we got it from. But I remember it was, like, five of us that chipped in. And we all went up to my attic, and we fucking put curtains on the wall, like a sheet, and we made sandwiches. Sandwich. And we thought we were about to see, like, this fucking, you know, like, fucking... Farrah Fawcett getting yeah. fucked. It was some chick with flat titties that had been shot. <laughs> you know, some black guy with a big, big dick. The kid, I mean, one of the kids, you know, and I, in the bit, I said that one of the kids started crying. He was like 12. Like, we were like 14, <laughs> yeah. 13, and we're watching this big black dick fucking a white chick. Like, we never saw that before. Everybody went home. Like, we're like, turn it off, turn it off. It's all over. Like, nobody wanted to have sex no more. 
That's bad. It, that's was how done. bad porn was. Yeah. yeah. You could buy anything in the fucking mail. Anything. Right out of a fucking magazine. The best was getting magazines and sending them to people's houses. You mean for like just like the CD or the cassette you so order I, them? I go to the dentist. I go to the dentist office. Yeah. You go to the magazine, People Magazine. That'd be a thing. Yeah. Fill it out. Send it in. We'll send you ten copies. I'd fill it out. Send it to Lisa Ayata. <laughs> for a year, any one time I went to an office, never something. I'd send them to Lee, and I'd wait for him to say one night, "I don't know what's going on. I keep getting these magazines sent to my house," and I would die of laughter. I would do that to people constantly. <laughs> If I wanted to fuck with you, I'd send you cabs. Like at 2 in the morning. Oh, and tell the cab driver yeah. to ring the doorbell. That my and then they're expecting the fare and everything. That my grandma's death, please ring the doorbell. This bitch was fine to the bone. And Stinky, my friend Stinky, used to give her the Maluk stick for her. So now we're double dating. During what, six months? He gave it to her like over four years every once in a while. In the winter. So, <laughs> Tasia took Glenn to the other room. I got Trish's in the other room. Now she's playing Catholic girl. You're starting to cry. I don't know. It hurts. <laughs> don't put it too close to my pussy. I got a half gram in my pocket. I don't need this aggravation. You know what I'm saying? So at six in the morning, I go, listen, get your life together. We'll go throw some holy water on it. It's like it never happened. I was a gentleman. And I go, listen, I got, a half, holy water. I got a half a G in my pocket. This will get me home. And I walked home. <clears throat> and guys, this is, I walked into the door where I was living. The phone rang. And it was her. And she goes, I thought about it. Let's do it. I'm like, all right. And she picked me up. It was 7 in the morning. went back to her house. I gave her a stab. And there was blood. There was tears. There was a lot of rub in the back. (laughs) And then she got to rub that back. I was going to say, who's back? I got to rub her back. She goes, I'm 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 not a virgin. I'm going to go to hell. Don't worry about it. There's plenty of dick in hell to party. Guilt. Let's start this fucking thing. So, yeah. Ah, damn. And guess what? Like a week later, I saw her. She was very cold to me. We had a couple of like weird discussions. I was totally in love with her. Like I was in love with her for reals. I would have gotten married at that age. Like that's how in love with her I was. But after those two weeks, I was like, you know what, something ain't right here. This is something beyond my control. And I was a criminal. I was a criminal. I had no future. And I didn't have I couldn't see there was no future. I kind of walked away from her a little bit. I went to Colorado. I heard she was dating some other guy, eating pills and partying and shit. Good friend of mine. I never held, held it accountable. Never even mentioned it to him. That was me and her were long done. And, and then I went back to New York one day and I went to a Coke dealer's house. And there she was looking beautiful. She said, hello. We talked a little bit. And she said, let's stay in touch. And between you and you and I, in my mind, the, the coop had flown already. It wasn't that I wanted to fuck her. I really liked her. I grew yeah. up with her. I've been around her for the last, you know, since 1978, I'd been around this girl. But something wasn't right, you know. And six months later, I called her because she was a travel agent. And I asked if she'd get me and my buddy Stinky plane tickets to Hawaii. <laughs> and she goes, call me tomorrow. I'll give you a quote. And when I called her the next day, she goes, I got to be honest with you. I'd rather you never call me. Really? Yeah, just like that. And I said, okay, okay, sirrah, sirrah. At the age of 21, I got one of my biggest lessons of love. Fuck them, send them roses, and move the fuck on, bitch. <laughs> Greetings from Podcastville. It is a pleasure to be here it's on the anniversary of your, it, would that be your inaugural incarcer- incarceration? Inaugural. That's, yeah. that's the first one. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be here on that anniversary, my friend. <laughs> That it was a Monday morning, and that Friday at four thirty they called. So that's what I wanted to ask you: Did you know you were going, or did did you get caught in something and taken? Right? No, out? I knew you were going to court. That I day. knew that. I knew I was. There was a good chance of me going to prison, but I didn't know for sure till that Friday. And what for? What was this one for? This was for the kidnapping. This was kidnapping. They called and they said, uh, the attorney goes, are you sitting down? And he goes, Department of whatever turns you down, community corrections. They turned you down. So you got two options. You're looking at prison or you're looking at me putting you into a work release program. But if community corrections turns you down, you can't stay in the community. So he goes, right now you're looking at a 10%, 90, 10, 
whatever you do this weekend, have a good weekend. Oh, and shit. And walk wow. into court Monday at 9. And I, right there, I sat. I got a little crushed. I took the chicken I was cooking out. I like that little grease on the side where you put your Italian bread in. I ate it, and I go, fuck it. If this is my last week, and I might as well make it a good one. I didn't cry. I didn't freak out. I knew this day was coming. When was the question? So right there I go, I'm not going to go to jail. I'm going to talk this judge out of it. Like that's how cocaine and how retarded I was. <laughs> I'm going to go tell this judge what time it is. Not well, a I, second I, I of any fucking I wasn't going to write, right. write a speech or nothing. I was just going to go in there and tell him what was going on here. Look, <laughs> he was selling drugs. Me and my friends were taking the drugs off the street. Where I come from, that's a superhero. Okay, so knock it off with the jail time here. This is a conversation amongst men. The cocaine's off the street. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Everybody's alive. Let us, let's wrap this up. You're welcome. Why are we going to pay the tax fucking payers? <laughs> Why are we going to burden the tax payers? Uh, that was the, all the way. Yeah, right. that I went and tended That cocaine in told you to that say. That was the cocaine. Yeah. And all weekend long, you should have heard me. I was like fucking Trump without the tele teleprompters. <laughs> I was fucking practicing and like telling them like this is what went down your own and it's no big deal. You know? You're it's no big deal. No big deal. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I never uh, forget walking in there on Monday and he looked me up up and down and my attorney saying, Do you have a he liked to address the speech. He liked to address the court. And I took two steps forward. And as I went to speak, my voice disappeared. I sounded out. like a little fucking mousy fag. I was like, you're right. I just want you to know that. And it just broke and broke and broke. Like he was he looked like a little Fidel Castro with a compact head. <laughs> he had a tiny little head, but it was all hair. He looked like a baby gorilla. <laughs> mm -hmm. All you could see were lips and two little white Italian eyes. <clears throat> I remember that. He told me to step back. Like I had broken apart. Like I just fell apart. Like, I'm not ashamed to say it. Whatever speech, whatever I have been doing on playgrounds and parks and delis for 20 years, he scared the fuck out of me. Like, my, my bro. I've never seen this on mushrooms, okay? And I don't know if it's the shrooms or the fact that he hit his head so goddamn hard on this thing, but I don't know what to do. And I look up at her, and she's, you know, she's see, like, oh, my God, it's coming for me next. You know that mindset where you're like, oh. And I just start smacking them as hard as I can in the fucking oh, face. Jesus. I'm smacking the shit out of them. Pink Floyd, the pigs are fucking going. Oh, I just lost my headphones. Sorry. And um, they're banging and banging and banging. And he's having a seizure. And then finally he snaps out of it. And everybody's like, holy shit. I'm like, dude, are you all right? He's like, did I just pass out? I'm like, yeah, yeah. I go, how long do you think you were out? And he's like, I don't know. It felt like three three minutes. He's like, yeah. I was like, you're out for about 15 seconds. I was like, dude, but you had a fucking seizure. Are you bleeding? He's like, I'm not bleeding. I'm like, are you all right? He's like, yeah. Look over her. They're out. They're gone. We never saw them again. We go back to fucking Pink Floyd, and he's fine the rest of the night. Where do you meet these weak people? <laughs> I went to a million concerts. We ate everything but heroin balls. And nobody ever fucking fainted. That's what I'm saying. You, you ever? Yeah, no, no. If that happened in my neighborhood, you'd have to move the next day. Like, you have to pick up a move. Like, dog, I took fucking Lee to a concert. And I gave him a couple of mushrooms. And fucking had fucking, a seizure. Dog, I used to fucking take straight up acid and go to those garden <laughs> concerts. I don't I know how I, you did that I shit. I took acid man. to I the Stones. Know. I took acid to Ted Nugent and ACDC. I took acid. I didn't take acid to Black Sabbath. I was too young, but I took acid to all those. You ever, um, you ever smoke weed dipped in PCP? Sherm, sure, what a sherm or no? Yeah. Well, this is what I was getting to. Okay, that I all right. So I'm sixteen. <laughs> the age, I'm laughing 15, at the age. Yeah. Fifteen yeah. to sixteen. Yeah, I'm going in that transition, and I'm doing micro dot acid. That's what it was called. It wasn't really that was those little like one hit tabs. I mean, tiny. You would okay. lose it. You had you had to wrap it in aluminum foil to see them, and then you had to take it out of the aluminum foil. And if it fell on the floor, you were done. Sometimes it was purple. Sometimes it was pink. Sometimes it was brown. But it was the size of a milliscule. That was the most popular acid. It was fifty fifty. It was basically rat poison. 
You did it. It was strict nine pages. <laughs> yeah, okay. You'd be grinding your teeth, looking around. <laughs> and shit. Oh. Tremendous. But you went for fucking eight to 12 hours. That's a long, that's a commitment. I mean, hard, huh? And, yeah. You know, now you're like, oh, thank God that's gone. <sighs> I you know, have anxiety so here. You it. said that I give you another bonk, do another bonk, and wake it up. And then you said the sunset. And you're like, oh, thank God I could go home now. And you go home and you drink milk and you go up to your room and you lay down. All of a sudden, the posters start moving again. <laughs> it was that type of shit. Like, it just did not go away. Go away. <laughs> and then. Uh, See, all this is not a sales point. To That's me. what I'm, like, I'm saying. This no, no, is what this, everyone's ever told me, it's though. Great. Yeah. It was just great. Then, then, <laughs> it's just great. The one I did to the to the Stones, honestly, that was the first time I had done that drug. And I wrote about this. It was like a three-day recovery. Like for three days. It just zapped you like that. And whistles and uh, electronic <laughs> shots going through my spine. Like, and I was just a young kid. And I was like, I think I got to stop this shit. Like, I really do. Like, I had only done it once, but then it was just too much fun. It was the drug of the era. It was the drug of the summer. Like, how many, I want to tell you, you know the Carlin bit where he talks about acid, right? It's right. like self-regulating. At some point, it'll say, stop. You oh know, just God. like, no. you were done. No. So. <laughs> but I how many it. hits would you say you've had? So then let's just say <laughs> that at, let's just do it by freshman year. Jesus Freshman Christ. year was when we really started cooking with gas with the ass that's like, three a week we would we would three a week <sighs> and then something new came along people were saying you gotta snort this shit now i had always made a promise to myself that i would never snort nothing but they were like it's just thc stems it's stems and people boil them and they shut the thing off and the white powder that sticks on the side they scrape that off, and that's what you snorting. It's harmless. And I saw, <laughs> and it was, I had like this, I had 18 friends, but there was always four that were like kind of smart, and they were the ones like, yeah, I want to do it. I'm like, you sure? So after weeks of trying, I said, let me do a line of that THC crystal. The well, keef? Like that keef that's on the, the crystals on the weed? It was white. And you're yeah. snoring. I've never heard this one. This is brand new to me snoring, right now. It's snoring, it's snoring, it's snoring. And we would do it. <laughs> First, I did it, and then I gave it a break. I went back to acid. But what kind of high is it? Like, what do you feel? Like fucking Gumby. <laughs> and fucking, <laughs> like, you're about, like, everything is just fucking flashing at you. Is it a different high than right. an acid so trip? It eventually, is. Eventually, I kept doing it and doing it. So I got to the point where... <laughs> My mother would go to the track on Sundays, and I knew she was going to be on all day. And me and this kid, Carlos Perez, would buy a $10 package of it, and we'd each get a six-pack of Low and Brow. I, yeah, I remember Low and Brow, the lion. Isn't that difference? like a lion? Yeah, tonight is kind of special. Kind of special. Yeah. The people <laughs> poor must say something more, but how tonight? Let it be low and brow. Sponsor yeah. the church, low and brow. Low and brow. So fucking we would get low and brows and get fucked up and then go on journeys. <laughs> we just walk and talk shit. When I get old, I want to be a doctor. I'm like, you know, and we just be like cars would almost hit us. <laughs> like, beep, what the fuck? Get out of the way, that type of shit. Like we would be fucked up. And then I found out it was actually angel dust. <laughs> <laughs> So, I said I had never heard somebody told in me, my life the mind boiling some stems. Yeah, I didn't know. What to <laughs> so What's now angel people, dust. People, angel dust is like PCP, gorilla biscuits, yeah. PCP, <laughs> animal tranquilizers, <laughs> and they turn them into a powder, and you fucking snort oh, them. Jesus Christ! And you so go casual. for eight hours, and then I found out it was you angel go for dust. eight hours. Like I tried, oh, and, and I didn't yeah, want to know, <laughs> and I didn't want to fucking know. So we used to play either or. We used to play a game God either damn. or. Either we do acid or we do THC crystals. Wait, all the THC crystals are called it. <laughs> so that's what it was called until one day somebody said, stupid, wake up. Oh. You're snorting animal tranquilizers. And How like, long had you been doing it, would you say, before you actually found out what it really was? About three and a half months. 
And I remember sitting there going, it doesn't THC surprise me. Crystal. You get fucked up. You know what? So can you explain this? You're like, all right. <sighs> I suckered for it. I've been over here. I would have been over here snorting with you. I'd have been like, it's a THC. THC, THC. They, they said. <laughs> Who said? The drug dealer said that. I mean, it was it was an eight hour. I remember one time I smoked oh, it with shit. a pregnant chick. What? I was like, no more. <laughs> In 1983, they would they would sell it in Harlem, and you could smoke it. <coughs> and it was called the tray. It was three dollars. It was a tray, and it was basically enough powder to sprinkle a joint with, and you could smoke it. Mm. That was that was maybe December, January, February of '84. No, no, of '83, maybe December of '82. It was cold out. I remember getting high with her at maybe 10 30 in the morning and take a, being on a bus at nine o'clock on Kennedy Boulevard, dropping me off on the corner and crossing the street to the bar going, Wow, thank God I'm fine. I finally got it together. Like I walked in and I was still a little gumby dust. Because yeah. then it was just called gumby dust. It was like animal tranquilizer. Yeah. So I wanted to tear of that shit. Me and my buddies were tearing that stuff up. That's why today, like I said before, I don't know what day I'm going to go on stage, shit in my hand, and take it out and throw it at the audience because one of these days, one of these cylinders are going to snap. Yeah. And the real Joey Diaz is going to come out. Dementia is definitely in my future, especially if we did these, this shit at the age of 13, 14. Yeah, it's early. That's hard stuff early, too. Early. I, I, I partied so hard. <sighs> My sh- freshman going into sophomore year that I got put in the hospital that September <clears throat> because I had a lung infection. And they threw me out on September 28, 1979. And I got out of the hospital at 11 o'clock. At 8 o'clock that night, I was smoking dope and doing acid again. Jesus Christ. It was like Muhammad Ali fought somebody. <laughs> I still remember what corner I'm on. My brother's ex-wife's house is on that corner and I know what house we sat on the steps like and I and I kept doing that powder and I kept snorting that shit and then one day I walked into the basement and my mom had these friends that she would hold shit for downstairs but it was always weed bales of weed like uh, the coffee bean type mm-hmm. bales and I would take a little off the top and I would spray it with water <laughs> to maintain the weight yeah. I put like the holes in and put like 12 ounces of water in the middle so it would stay heavy. So when they put it on the scale, I was a fucking genius. Oh, back then. that's great. And I fucking, uh, but one time I went down in there and it wasn't uh, weed, it was Coke. A couple of bales of Coke. So I would open up the bales and fucking take a gram. I wouldn't do them. I would give it to a buddy of mine that was a real cool dude. And he would say to me, Where'd you get that shit? Oh my God! I saw Chinese people. You know, it was it was real cocaine. This shit. And I, every once in a while, I'd scrape a little and take it and give it to him. This went on for about a month or two. Then the guy became a cop, so now I owned him. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. Said, you know, I knew he was going to do something with his life, and he became a cop. Boom! Now I owned him. But that's not the point of the story. I held on to that one. One dad took it, and, and I would surprise him. Like in 1979, when somebody would surprise you with cocaine, you pretty much sucked this day. <laughs> in 1979, walking into a room with cocaine, those two chicks were going to suck your dick. They knew, forget Harvey Weinstein, you, you'd make Harvey Weinstein look like a fucking gay guy. That's how strong the power of cocaine was. Guys like me could get laid. Women were doing disgusting things. It was a different level of disgust because it meant you had power. It was like this social. If you came out of a bathroom and you went, the whole bar would look at you and come over and rub your shoulders. How is it? It's semi intense. You know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what was going on at yeah. Studio Fifty Four. This cocaine freedom makes me, you know. So that shit sold it made white people go crazy but at the same time i hadn't done it i held on to that little package then the night before some cats called me up and they're like we're playing hooky tomorrow 
So I said, fuck it, let me bring the packets and see if one. Well, but these guys are too straight. There was like eight of us, but one of the other dudes was a genius. And him and I used to do fucking that angel dust shit at school from time to time. And one day I gave him a line. He thought it was coke. I gave him a line of that shit, and he had a wrestling match, a high school wrestling match. Oh, my God. Movie. And he was on the bottom, and he made a move, and he bit the guy. <laughs> he got disqualified. <laughs> and people were like, why would you bite the guy? Fucking Coco gave me fucking THC crystal. Uh, THC I thought the crystal, guy was yeah. beat me up and shit. That's what we all called it, to, uh, <laughs> to avoid the pain of what it really was. Right, yeah. You know? My brother, um, he and a buddy, I actually told this whole story on my album, but he and a, and a, and a, a cousin brought some shit home one time, and they called it Sherm. It was a, and, and they would call it Paul Chuck Paul. That's what they call PCP, Paul Chuck Paul. And they would, um, they would, it was popular for a little while to dip this shit in PCP, these joints. And I, I thought it was a myth at first. I was like, ah, it doesn't happen. Because you hear shit on, like, Oprah, people doing it, dipping their cigarettes and cooking their babies and shit. Like, insane stuff that these suffocating kids and freezers, like. And um, they decided to smoke it in front of me. And, you know, I tell that story. But the, the thing was, I thought it was a one and done thing for them. You know what I mean? Like, I knew they had done it. But it's like the summer of 94. I'm fresh off the Pink Floyd concert. I go back to Maryland for the summer before for between college. And I'm seeing this girl at the time and we're going to Lollapalooza. Now, originally Nirvana was going to headline. I, I'm almost positive it's 94. And then Cobain died. Um, so they brought the Smashing Pumpkins in to fill that space. And it was a great, it was like Tribe Called Quest. I think the Beastie Boys were there. Fucking P-Funk was there. Uh, the Smashing Pumpkins. Like it was, it was a good one. Um, and um, they're smoking a joint. And I don't think anything of it. I just think it's a joint. And the girl I'm seeing at the time goes over to take a hit. You know, she smokes weed. And uh, she comes back and she's like, that tasted really weird. And I was like, you motherfucker. And I went over to my brother. And I'm like, is that fucking weed or is that that shit you were smoking? They no, it's the, the fuck. I go, what do you fuck? You, you, got, you can't just let some, you got to tell somebody that. Well, we thought she knew. I'm like, why would anyone assume that you're smoking PCP laced weed over here? Why would anyone? Why would that be your immediate? It probably should be the way you treat life. But why would anyone assume that anyway? They make the best top shelf margarita oh, in the country at the time for four fifty. Red Robin. My credit card was just margarita, margarita, margarita. Red Robin, Red Robin. I would go to Red Robin every night, do two margaritas, two two top shelves, do two bumps, and fuck it from there. <laughs> whatever you need me to do, I'll do. It. You know what I'm saying? I would have a little car sale, and he'd drive me home. He kept asking me, "You don't have no more coke?" Nah, I did it all. I had a gram in my pocket. I'd go home and fucking. Bang out blow. And then I got promoted. Now I'm thinking about the salesman shit. The guy told me what they're making over there. And it was a lot more than what I was making. And I'm like, should I go over and sell fucking cars? I don't know nothing about cars. And these are the same ones, the Acuras, the Subarus, the Mitsubishi. This is Subaru. Okay. So these guys they back then on. they had the what the brat they were the one with the seats in the back remember those suicide yeah, yeah, seats yeah, 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 yeah. They had outside. the brat they had a bunch of great yeah. cars back then so I'm in, I'm in a, this real decisive mode but what happened was there was a, a crew of detailers and this just happens to me in all places what happened was I started out working them I started how to figure out the system. The system was to do two new cars a day and three used cars. That's where your money's at. The two new cars with easy money. You just rip the paper off. You got to put a certain chemical on them to take the Cosmoline off. You put the rims on. You armor all the inside. You put the mats down. You wash the car and you dry it. That's it. It's no big deal. Nobody's ever sat in the car. You just right, got to put yeah. the hub caps on, put the fucking mats in, you know, a couple things. You got to adjust. <clears throat> set the stations, whatever the fuck they want. Then you take it to the thing. I could do two of those in an hour. So I would make two fucking runs, and they never heard of that. I'm like, why go make runs and pick them up? Let's get two done. And I did two new cars by the 11, and then I jump on three used cars. I was making some good fucking money, mm -hmm. but they started fucking with me. You know, they wouldn't give me a bay. They would go, oh, if you could park two cars out there, 
we could put two cars in here. So it was like really four against three, and the supervisor liked them. So I'm like, this supervisor really wants to fuck with me. And then like a week after that one day, he goes, I'm going to fucking write you up for insubordination. Something crazy. Because I told him, I'll do the car outside. No big deal. You can't do it outside. I go, relax. Watch your fucking tone. And the, But the manager was from New York. And the manager knew I was a little fucked up. And the owner was a great white dude. You know those white dudes that drink whiskey and they don't want to watch porn? But they appreciate a good sense of humor. Like you could tell that the dude was uptight and shit. Yeah, he was just a great white dude, but he liked me because I fucking made money and I hustled my ass off. You know, I was getting in there with him at six in the morning. You weren't supposed to be there till late. If I started coke till five, what's the difference? What am I gonna do? Yeah. Sit here and look out the window by myself? I might as well go pick up a piece of fucking thirty, forty dollars at the time. That was my mentality. So they started picking on me. They started fucking with me. Like, they really, you're going to fuck with me? And at that time, I had the whole body shop wired. I knew where to get weed. I knew where to get coke. I knew who was selling this, who was selling that. There was a creepy dude who installed stereos there. Creepy as fuck. You In know, what way? What was every, every day, man, I went to the strip club last night. Oh. And I met this girl, Melinda. Her working name was Gunner. And... <laughs> You know, he's he got, was really creepy. He's got the like, fake real name. Uh, like, just a creepy strip club guy. He knew all the strip clubs. When people would talk about strip clubs, he'd come out and give you cards for VIP of this one. He was friends with the Bandereno, the Banderos bike gang. I got reefer from him. I got coke from him. He sold a bunch of shit, but he had everything a guy that was trying to prove something had. Tinted windows, a loud stereo. Tattoos, leather jacket, a motorcycle, a pit bull. Any, <laughs> anything that a guy the, needs the kit, to get attention. Starter kit. Yeah. yeah, he was just. <laughs> but he was like a half a retard. But I kind of liked him. His drugs were good. <laughs> he always told me about dirty pussy, how he would finger these strippers and he would fuck them and all this shit. So it's Speaking great. of drugs, can we smoke during this? You can do whatever okay, the fuck you want. You can light your asshole on fire. You know I mean? <laughs> So, one day this dude, Dirk, gets in my face about some shit. I've told this story before, but I don't think I've told it to you, Ryan Sickler. I want to hear it. Now, I'm fucking nuts, Ryan Sickler. I'm 24. Yeah, no shit. Fresh out of fucking Jersey. I just slept in benches. I just went through that whole fucking homeless thing, you know. Now, I'm living in Boulder, but I'm, I'm keeping a lid on it. I got a girlfriend. I have to go to her family's house every Sunday to eat. They're very nice people. They're from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> They're from Buffalo, New York. They're very nice people. I appreciate them. So I got to act like a fucking man, and these people get in my faces. So there was particularly two white dudes, both from Minneapolis, Minnesota, that would fuck with me, and they had a, and they would beat me because they had the the fucking the, supervisor? the supervisor in that corner. So one day I see the supervisor walking in and I don't know what he took his jacket off and he hung it up. And I don't know what made me do this, but this is the mind of Joey Diaz. You know the mm -hmm. the dude thought he got over on me? Yeah. But I'm gonna show him he I, I'm gonna get over on him. I just didn't know how and all of a sudden the good Lord <laughs> does something he does every fucking day. He kills a mouse. I turn around, and there's a dead mouse four foot from me, maybe three inches long. I see that everybody's washing cars. I go, what can I do with this mouse? I got a paper towel. I pick it up by the tail, and I put it in the guy's pocket, the supervisor's pocket. I put it in his pocket. I get high. I keep working on cars. I forget about the whole thing. The next morning, I'm in there at 6 o'clock buzzing out of the car, and you hear a car come in like, doo-doo, 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 doo-doo. And he gets out in the car and he goes, what the fuck? Shut it down. Shut it down. I just got into a major car accident. He goes, I reached in my pocket for cigarettes wow. and somebody put a mouse in there. Ah, By the end of the day, crashed. I'm going to find out who it is. I have an idea who it is. And I'm fucking, <coughs> you know me, dog. I'm like, I'll help you find the fucking <laughs> Yeah, that son of a bitch. Oh, I had the, that. But that motherfucker knew it was me or some other guy. His car was all crashed up. He fuck crashed. him. Fuck him. <laughs> so right there, I knew it was time for me to go. 
<laughs> so by <about> April 15th. <laughs> I, We're I, in April now, everybody. April I, 1980s. I tell the fucking, I tell the fucking, uh, the fucking car, the dealership, the, I, I cut him a deal. I tell the detail guys that I'm going to go sell cars for one day and try it. And after one day, I don't know if I like it or not. And they said, okay, when do you want to do this? I go, Monday. So I put together what I had as a suit at that time. And I went there Monday. They told me to be there at 8 to learn about some cars. And they gave me to this guy named Jimmy Wheeler. God rest his soul. I, I, still, to his son, I still talk to his son on That's Facebook. That's amazing that you remember these Cody names. Cody Wheeler. I remember this guy's name because he was the first guy that made me feel like family without being at home. He was one of those guys that he was willing to take a, a bullet for you. Mm -hmm. And again, God put this guy in my life. And on the first day, he just dug me. We were big-time Bruce Lee fans. That's why I brought you the shirt. Thank you for that shirt. And he had the Tao of Jeet Kune Do signed by Bruce Lee. Nobody had that at the time. And he was from Detroit. He just impressed the shit out of me. And he gave me a shirt once. Detroit, the murder capital of the United States of America. It was my favorite shirt. I wore it all summer long. People would say to me, why do you wear that shirt? It's disgusting. I fucking love Detroit. I want to go to fucking Detroit. Like, I, I'm ready for Detroit. Fuck these pussies. Like, that's how crazy I was at the time. And that first day with Jim Wheeler, I ended up selling three cars, making a thousand bucks on paper and like 200 in spips cash. At 7 o'clock, I called the body shop and told him to suck my dick. <laughs> I'm never washing the car again. <laughs> I went to my mother-in-law. God bless her soul, my ex-mother-in-law, who I loved dearly at the time. And she lent me her uh, May DNF card. And she let me charge $500. I bought three suits, shirts, pants. And I was all in, guys. You were selling cars in Denver? Well, not Denver. Boulder. Boulder. And the first month, I ended up selling 14 cars. Damn. I was the salesman That's every other of the day, month. damn near. I was the salesman of the month. <laughs> I think I came in second. Did you get maybe. a special spot and all that shit? Yeah, like if I got a demo for free. You had to sell 12 cars to get your car for free. Or you had to pay 300 a month. So that was the magic number. 12, you get your demo. And then they had weird bonuses. Like once you sell... 10 cars, your bonus goes from 20 to 30%. 11 cars, 35%. 12 cars, 40%. Uh, 15 cars, 40% plus a $500 cash bonus. They worked it. Plus, every new Subaru you called, every new Subaru you sold, you ripped the thing. And you looked at it, and they would either give you money or you spun the wheel. You called Subaru. And they tell you, you won $350, and you'll get your check in the mail. 